if we move now specifically on to police volunteers, then police volunteers uh, very much um, is it, it is in uh, in then the community engagement box in that those volunteers are themselves community members, uh, hmm. local uh, residents very often who are putting themselves forward to support uh, entirely on a voluntary basis uh, the yes. work of their local police force in some way yeah. or other. Uh, now, um, this brings us on to your Churchill Fellowship. So let's let's start on this um, uh, specific uh, examination of what your specialist subject, if I can put it that way, <laughs> yeah, police volunteers. Um, tell us first about the Churchill Fellowship and what that is, what that enables you, has enabled you to do. Yes, I've had a huge privilege of being awarded a Churchill Fellowship this year, which I've recently returned from what has been an almost eight week study trip to look at um, volunteer auxiliary policing in Canada and New York, volunteer reserve policing in, I think it was six different states of the US and the, and the model of volunteers in, in the National Police Service in the Netherlands. So fascinatingly, different examples of how you know quite, quite quite different traditions of volunteering have you know grown and flourished in different places and some of them you know really interestingly different to the models we have in have in the UK and and I think you know one of the things which has struck me from the Churchill fellowship trip has been just the scale of this that you know a reasonable est a reasonable estimate is that there will be you know, 100,000 or more auxiliary and reserve police across Canada and the, you know, and the USA. But this is, you know, the, you know this is a substantial part part of policing. And and the wonderful thing about the Churchill Fellowship is that you know, the whole idea is to fund people with a, yeah, you know, with a passion for a subject to go and look at it in, you know, in in very different settings around the world to learn from it and then to bring back that learning to the UK whilst at the same time yeah being able to share some of our best practice and ways that we do things in the UK with the with the people that I visited and and, and yes the, 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 the charity is wonderful in the sense of you know supporting that but then just letting you go and you know and and and, and and sort of see things for yourself and 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 also to fund so that you've got the time to properly be able to spend time with people in programs and really learn about them so it has been a it has been a wonderful few weeks so it, as i understand it this is a a uh, a, a grant uh, of some uh, low thousands of pounds sterling yeah. that is um, made available to fund your travel and accommodation in order to further uh, the the research in, in the specific areas and it's a competitive um, um, environment you effectively put in a, a submission then those uh, assessing the Churchill Churchill fellowship submissions will determine which ones are granted this award and you are one of a very small number this particular year for which many congratulations this particular year who have have been awarded that grant now I, I think you're pretty much uh, only a handful of weeks back from this uh, eight or so week study trip. So you won't yet have written up your findings, no. <laughs> I suspect. So we're getting a very early sight of, of, of this, very early sort of observations from, uh, from that trip. Give, give us some of those, those early insights uh, ahead of uh, what, what I'm sure will be a fascinating uh, report uh, and and uh, paper that you put together in due course. Yeah, I found I I found it very interesting to look at how the models of police volunteering have yeah you know, have grown in different you know have grown in different places. But the 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 auxiliary model of policing in Canada is is less directly comparative to a police officer and has more of an emphasis on 
community engagement, prevention, problem solving, whereas some of the reserve policing models in the you know, in the United States are very much, you know, reserve officers alongside their their paid officer okay. colleagues. Working. So if I understand that right, then the, the, the US reserve officer looks very similar to the US um, serving police officer. Um, whereas in uh, Canada, um, the, the, the reservist, I hope I'm using a sufficiently good expression, but the reservist um, does not look like a member, for example, of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the, the Mounties. Um, is that correct? Yes. So, so so they tend to use the language of auxiliary officer in Canada. The auxiliary officers, you know, wear uniform, they are visible out in the communities, but they don't have all of the powers and all of the training of a, you know, of, of, of the police officers that are working alongside. And they can only do certain things out in the community under the supervision and with the support of a police officer. Whereas, you know, one of the things which has really struck me in several of the police departments I've visited in the United States is how fully equivalent and fully operational some of their reserve volunteers are. So when I've been on ride-alongs with volunteer officers, but there has literally been no difference. They've been responding to the same calls. They've been operating in the same way and they're uniform is absolutely indistinguishable so so essentially when you've been on a scene with paid officers and volunteer officers it's it has been impossible to distinguish the difference and and, and that's very striking for volunteer roles in you know in policing contexts which are very challenging you 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 know officers are armed there is you know but but there is much more involvement of firearms in terms of the, you know, of the operational front line of, of policing. And some of the places I've visited around, you know, Los Angeles, Phoenix, New York, Washington, DC are, you know, are places which are challenging policing environments. And, and, and I think there is something very impressive about how these volunteer programs, you know, essentially reproduce that, but that, that entirely capable, interoperable volunteer who, you know, you know, you, you know, these people have their other walks of life, they're doing their other things, and then they're coming and volunteering and and and, and being on that front in addition, line. In addition yeah. to holding down their day job. And it also suggests that in the United States, the auxiliaries, I think you said they should be called, are they they must be very well trained in order then to be um, uh, taking on the roles of uh, permanent members uh, of staff, or, or permanent officers, uh, whereas presumably in uh, Canada, there is less of a need for those auxiliaries to be trained quite to the same extent. Yeah, and I think this is where some of the you know interesting questions about how you develop you know programs arise. So in those reserve models in the United States, which are, you know, which achieve an equivalency, you you have essentially two routes into them. You have a police academy which directly mirrors in full the professional training. So the, the professional training that a new aid officer receives, receives and volunteer officer receives are entirely the same. But, they're delivered in a different way because one is delivered to part-time volunteers so it's evenings and weekends and it's delivered over a longer period of time and then the sort of professional field training the experiential tutoring is delivered over a longer period of time but the same number of hours are delivered so that that, that direct route of someone in the community who's coming into that volunteer role is is managed to be directly equivalent. So there is, you know, there is not a narrative that the volunteers are less trained, less safe, less operationally capable. In, and, and actually by learning more slowly the time for reflection between, you know, training episodes or, you know, shifts out there working as an officer, but 
there are actually advantages sometimes to that training model and and yeah, and, and, and in discussions, often the volunteers have more opportunity to practice the ability to do more scenarios because of the nature of the group and and, and, and the nature of how training is delivered. The, the other route into that reserve training model is that in lots of places I've visited in the States, there is a flow of paid personnel when they retire or when they leave earlier in career perhaps from paid roles to continue on as a as a volunteer reserve, which obviously brings a considerable then, you know, policing experience that they're bringing over into the into the volunteer role. Um, so and, these these are individuals going from their full time career into yeah. in, in sort of policing retirement, if I can put it that way, yeah. um, volunteering, coming back in. Yeah. Uh, uh, and bringing and so that the force hangs on to that wealth of experience yeah. um, with with the officer the former officer perfectly content to provide that service as a volunteer yeah and and and, and, and i think there are yeah there are obviously huge advantages for policing in that but i think what i've you know what what, what i've built by talking to a lot of people is that sense of you know why those individuals would want to do that because yes yes absolutely why would they want to do that yeah i'm, I'm yeah. intrigued yeah and i think that you know that's partly keeping the connections with the agency i think i think often for police you know paid personnel for police officers for you know sheriff's deputies who've who've you know worked in policing for 25 30 35 years it's it's a huge part of their identity a huge part of a life many of the social networks are rooted around the policing organization and actually you know that sense of a total disconnect that you retire one day and you've moved away from policing and you never have any involvement with it again can actually not be the right thing for people because you know often people then struggle in that retirement you know where, 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 I can where totally see people. that yes be, 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 and, and, and I think the other bit which comes over really strongly is that often when people, you know, progress in their paid policing careers, they they progress into promoted roles, they progress into particular areas of policing. And um, and actually what, what you can do as a volunteer is you can leave behind some of the organizational stresses and challenges which we all know from the various sort of academic surveys of police officers around the world, it's often the, the, the organisational context of being an employee in policing and, you know, leadership and the working conditions and those sorts of things which, you know, are the, are the negative factors for people rather than the frontline experience of, of policing. And, and what you can do coming back as a volunteer is to have the frontline experience of policing the yeah the and, and and to be able to choose that not only when you're doing it but the nature of thing you're doing so yeah i talked to one person who'd you know retired as a senior rank as a detective but what they yeah what they loved to do was stuff around you know yeah police you know police bikes and around and 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 yes. and, 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 and essentially they've come back to do the part of operational policing that they enjoy doing and they've never lost the you know they've never lost the love of frontline policing and those aspects of it even if perhaps they had begun to lose the love for some of the organizational dynamics that they'd had in the paid uh, role absolutely maybe as they as they uh, progressed in their career found that they were getting more involved in the managerial and ad administrative role uh, yeah. rather than the, what they first loved when they joined policing. But 